Hey guys, <clears throat> this is Onya, and I know this is kind of a lot of videos of Jubilees all at once, but as I said in the previous videos that I have just uploaded recently of Jubilees, that we have done a lot of videos studying Jubilees, but I haven't uploaded them in a long time, so I'm kind of backlogged in that. So I'm trying to catch up because for a long time I did not have, I did not have the time, the luxury of time to upload things because it takes a while to up upload it all. I, I had a full-time job that was very overwhelming, and I had a full-time girlfriend, which was also very uh, overwhelming in many ways. So I don't have a full-time, well, I don't have a girlfriend at all anymore, and I don't have a job right now. So I do have that free time available to catch up on what I have missed so far loading all the teachings that I've done so it we're almost I'm almost caught up this one is is like the near okay basically I have like four four more videos that I have to that I have to load I think uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Three, three more videos that I have to load up and beyond this one, so uh, I shall be caught up soon. But for this video, I want to give you guys a little preview of what the video is going to be about. So we continue with the Jubilees study, and in this one specifically, we focus on the origin of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. What's very interesting is Jubilees tells us the Feast of Unleavened Bread originated with Abraham. So I go in depth in that and kind of elaborate on that. Also, we discuss in this video the ten trials that Abraham faced, a common tradition in the rabbinic tradition, but also found in the Book of Jubilees. And I explain what the ten trials are. And then I talk about Keturah and and her family that she had with Abraham and the implications of that, which is very interesting. Next, I talk about Jacob's superiority, how basically Jacob was far superior to Esau and, I, and Jubilees goes into that and explains why. And we see how Rebecca understood that Jacob was superior. And Jubilees goes into great detail about how Rebecca was extremely, an extremely righteous woman. So the, the true righteousness of Rebecca shines greatly in Jubilees, and, and we go in, into that and discuss it. And then a big section of this video has to do with Abraham's family instruction. So he gathers all his kids and his grandchildren together and just teaches them about how to be righteous and points them back to historical events from the, that happened in the time of Enoch and Noah and just discussing the laws of how to be obedient to the Creator. And then uh, it, the rest of the video has to do mainly with the origin of the Samaritans as well as the Arabs, but heavy focus on the Samaritans. It was kind of a tangent that we discussed where one of the people participating asked about the Samaritans and we kind of went into a big tangent on that. But it's very interesting and we discuss in-depth information about the Samaritans and the, and the Samaritan Torah. And also we talk about how obedience to the commandments of righteousness brings you blessings and good health, generally speaking, and how disobedience brings you illness and disease and harm, generally speaking. So that's pretty much the gist of this Bible study on Jubilees. Hope you guys enjoy it, and please, if you are led to do this, uh, consider consider trying to help out my ministry in, so, in, so, in any way that you feel is what you're supposed to do, either monetarily or spiritually or through your talents, whatever you feel is what you, you can contribute to the cause it would be greatly appreciated. So with that said, 
I uh, hope you guys enjoy this Bible study on Jubilees. Shalom, and God bless you guys. Home around 6.20 or 6.30. So, like, three. it took me like three hours to get home. It was ridiculous. It's supposed to be the, the worst snow up there ever. Well, I don't know about ever, but, yeah, it's okay. not fun. Um, let me just open the... I'm going to open the tab. If for some reason it stalls, because I have like a bunch of tabs open, so if it stalls, I might have to force close uh, the internet and then reboot. No uh, problem. So if that happens, just to uh, uh, say some stuff while I'm gone, just to kind of uh, entertain people. We'll have Allison play the fiddle. Uh, no, the oud. The ood now. Dude. The ood dude. That's you, Allison, the ood dude. Ha! I'm not the dude, man. Don't do that. The ood dudette. Okay, that's better. Okay. Um, just about ready. Who are who else did you say we're waiting on? I got three more people that are supposed to come. Okay. If they don't, then you know the recording should uh, Yeah, that's right. Um, the reason I put this hat on is I like these headphones, but, um, they hurt my ears. Like, yeah, it, like just really yeah. sore. Absolutely. That's an awesome idea, honey. I never thought of that. Yeah. No, it's a good idea. I, I, I tend to have good, good ideas from time to time. Um, before I start, I just want to say Donald, uh, like, I like. I was having a heated discussion earlier today, and someone said something all, along the lines of, "I never change my belief based on evidence. Um, like I don't really listen to any evidence uh, unless, like, like I don't I don't change my beliefs unless I decide to." Which was just seemed like a really dumb comment because, from my perspective everyone is like that like so why do, why do any of us believe anything we believe we believe it because we did some research and we came to the conclusion um to the best of our understanding and and we're wrong on some of what we believe but we're not going to change our beliefs until we see compelling evidence for us like some evidence might be compelling for compelling for other people um other evidence might not be as like that evidence might not be compelling for different people. It just, it all depends on what their standard is. Um, but in like the whole debating thing, you know, I, I'm just trying to argue for what I believe, um, based on what I've seen, I'm not trying necessarily to win a debate. Um, I always encourage, challenging what I say like I don't want people to believe it just because I I tell people that's that's something I always uh try to encourage but I think I am like most people and that I think I'm right on what I believe because I wouldn't I wouldn't believe it if I thought I was wrong so I think that's yeah. how everyone is all right I have a question sure I'm going to put something on here just see if you can hear it all right okay Can you hear that? Did you hear a piano music playing? No. Um, I heard the, the faintest little thing. I, it didn't really sound like piano, but I heard a okay. noise of some sort. Let me do it one more time, because I'm working on something else while I'm listening. If you didn't hear that, then I'm good. Yeah, yeah. no. We, I didn't hear that. And you okay. know... If, if any of that piano stuff gets into the video, you know, it'd be a nice soundtrack for, for the, uh, the video. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Chris notes. As long as it's not like anything inappropriate, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I guess we'll get started. You want to start the thing? Sure, it started. You really look like an alien tonight, or... <laughs> I don't know, maybe yeah. a Russian uh, guy. Illegally illegal. Yeah. So, okay. 
Uh, let me introduce to you the one and only act is here. Onia Carlson. Hello, with everybody. Jubilees. Yes, we haven't done Jubilees in a while. Just things came up for me, and also, you know, there was the Sukkot event. So, but I, I heard that you guys wanted me to continue with the Jubilee series. Yes. Um, in the past, when I've done ser like studies on certain books, I often don't finish. Like I go through a lot of it, but I don't end up going through the whole thing. This one might be one of the first ones we finish together. If, if you guys keep wanting it, we'll just keep going through it. Uh, I believe we left off with when Abraham sacrificed his son or was imminently about to sacrifice his son and we kind of talked a little bit about the whole circumcision thing so we're gonna kind of pick off from there today and my hope is that i think we should be able to get to the end of abraham's life um we're probably not going to get into the whole jacob story much i i think um can i do a recap uh, like of the whole thing that we've done so far, Allison's asking if I could do a recap. Can you can you just do a brief rundown because there's been a gap to catch people up if they're just starting in to listen to this again, just the high points maybe, and say this is where we are now, but this 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 and this. If that's too much, it's fine. I understand. For jubilees, um, like probably not. From from now, from from the beginning that we started till now, or just last time? Eh, probably from last time to this, because I think there's enough there to for everyone to listen to, but they might want a little intro into this one. Sorry. Okay. Um, well, so, I don't exactly remember the content of everything we did in the last video, but I, I just know that we ended on that major note of the whole concept of the covenant of circumcision and we also touched upon the 10 trials of of uh that abraham went through and how the the rabbis actually have that same tradition which is found in jubilees that abraham was tested by 10 trials and he passed uh, each trial so we we discussed kind of which what those trials were and uh we i also briefly alluded to something that we're probably going to discuss today and that's the whole thing with abraham's bosom so i'll probably mention that again but so that's the best i can do without really looking over the video again to give like a, a brief overview but so let me just get to the to the chapter uh I think, oh yeah, and we also talked about Mestima, which is, I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but Mestima, as, as a Hebrew name or Hebrew word, I think it means, they translate it as hostility or hostile one. And this is actually related to the word for Satan in Hebrew. Satan and Mestima come from the same root. So you have Satan, the root is sat, S-A-T, or whatever middle vowel you're going to put in there. And that same root, S-T, is in mastima. But mastima has the prefix mem, that's where you ha have the ma, and then it has the suffix, the m, uh, also. So it has the prefix and suffix mem on each end of it. Um... So it's like the basic, the basic root of, of Satan uh, is in this word. So that's kind of interesting. And we touched on how Mestima is like, in some ways he's good, but in other ways he's bad. He started out bad and then he's, he was chosen for a role. And he is basically the prince of demons, and he and he has that role to test people. 
so we kind of we touched upon that a little bit but that's a huge uh, theme that you'll see in other scriptures like the uh, homilies of clement recognition of clement in in the nazarene acts there it has that that concept of satan being a servant of elohim to punish people and to test them so. now sorry i'm just getting right back is that hebrew say it again mastama yeah that, that's in hebrew that's, that's a hebrew. okay Ju jubilees was found in Dead Sea Scrolls, and it was found in Hebrew. And, and the okay. mystema is a Hebrew word. I'm sure, I mean, I'm not sure, but it probably has a Aramaic cognate. Yeah. It, like, it probably occurs in Aramaic as well, so, some similar form. Um, let's see here. So, okay, so now this is interesting. I want to start off here. So after Abraham does the sacrifice um, or the almost sacrifice of Isaac, we see that um, right after this, he goes and keeps a feast for seven days. Now, Jubilee tells us that this all occurred during the first month. So does anyone know what seven-day festival occurs in the first month? Well, we know it's the, the seven days of unleavened bread. It doesn't specify unleavened bread in this festival that Abraham's doing. What we see in Jubilees sometimes is that certain festivals originate with patriarchs, but not all the customs originate at the time. So some of the customs might have come later, like unleavened bread, for example. But the seven days of fe of like festival, like uh, rejoicing or a holy time, that originated according to Jubilees with Abraham. And and Jubilees, as as I discussed before, has this overarching theme of the origin of the law. This commandment was first commanded at this time. And it points us to when it all came about. The Torah, as Jubilees tells us, is gradual. It comes into each law becomes binding and relevant at different points of time. And so the seven days of unleavened bread and originated with Abraham, as we are as we see here. And And, uh, okay, and Jubilees tells us that because Abraham celebrated this festival, the, uh, it was ordained that Israel and the seed of Israel should ordain it. So it's very much connected with Abraham. Israel is basically the ultimate fulfillment of Abraham's covenant. So, and that is why Israel is to keep all the holy days that Abraham originated. And on these, on the, what's, very cool is that in a lot of these holy days that originate, they coincide with a covenant that was made with a patriarch, either Abraham or Jacob. So we see when covenants are made, that is commemorated by a festival. And that is essentially the origin of the festival days. They are commemorating significant events that deserve to be commemorated, uh, and especially in regards to the covenant of Abraham and its in its fulfillment through Israel, because Israel uh, Israel is like the ultimate fulfillment of everything that was specified for Abraham. So that that's why we see that. Originally, it, it came from Abraham and for his family, but it was transferred to Israel specifically due to Israel being sanctified. Abraham and his family was sanctified, but when Israel came about, then Israel became the holy line. 
Now, um, Jubilees tells us that in chapter 19, what's chapter 19 right now? It tells us that the angels actually tested him. It was the angels who tested him uh, to see if, if he was patient with Sarah uh, when he was trying to bury her. And basically the implication is that Abraham did the right thing. Instead of trying to force force it to be, uh, for, force force them to allow him to bury Sarah there, he tried to do it the proper way. And, Ju and Genesis kind of presents it as like this was a very noble thing he did, but Jubilees kind of presents it as this was a very righteous thing because if he didn't do this, it would have indicated some lack of righteousness on his part. Um, now, so let me mention this for a second. There are certain things, scribal things, which to me have marks of additions by scribes from later times. And one of the examples here, we see it says in verse 5, chapter 19, And they gave him the land of the double cave over against Mamre, that is Hebron, for 400 pieces of silver. So it gives that like clarification, that is Hebron. And that just seems like, I don't see why an angel would tell Moses this. It makes more sense that a later scribe is saying, okay, let's tell people that this is Hebron so they get the connection. Because later people might not have been familiar with the geography. So it, that, for me, that, that is plausible. And there's a lot of instances like that throughout scripture of changes, small changes, which don't really, they're, they're not a big deal, but they very much seem to have the mark of a scribal edition. And for those who are new, you know, I'm not sure if anyone here is new to my teachings, but uh, for the recording that will be on YouTube, I'm sure there will be people who listen to it who've never in, in, encountered my teachings before. And something to keep in mind is that uh, I am of the position in, of a radical sort that the scriptures are very much corrupted. Not to a point that the scriptures are unreliable, but that but there have been, been a lot of changes. So don't be surprised when I say things like, how there's a lot of additions uh, in the scriptures. And, and uh, we've talked about this before with Jackson. Jackson's group, especially with the Nazarene Acts, it has touched a lot upon how there are errors, corruptions, falsehoods in the scriptures. Uh, anyways, I'll, I'll continue because that's a tangent. Sorry, I just want to read a second here. Okay. So another interesting thing, I mean, this is found in Genesis as well, but I, I just love this because it's so foreign and most people skip over this and don't really think about it but it basically says that Abraham married a third had a third woman and he, he married a woman named Keturah and he had a whole family with Keturah this was after Sarah died so so uh, you know he had six sons from from Keturah 
And it's just amazing to think about he had a whole other family. Like imagine when you're 90 years old and then you start over and have a new family. Like that's crazy. Now, um, Jubilees gives us a detail that's very cool. It, it tells us that who he, who Keturah was from. It says Keturah was among the daughters of his household servants. I don't think Genesis tells us that. Hold on a sec. I just need to, I just need to blow my nose for a sec. I'm sorry. My nose is stuffy. Yeah, as I said earlier, I was outside for well, a lot trying to get home from work today. So, um, so also this passage tells us uh, verse eleven of chapter nineteen. It tells us that it says Abraham took to himself a third wife, and her name was Keturah, because Hagar had died before Sarah. The implication here is that um, Abraham would have married Hagar if she was still alive. Uh, but she wasn't, so he married someone else. And there are people who teach that Abraham had all three women at the same time as wives. He had that he had Sarah, Hagar, and Keturah all at the same time. Jubilees refutes that. And as we know, the Dead Sea Schools has a very much anti-polygamy perspective in general. Well, the, Jubilees has certain things as well that kind of fits in with that anti-polygamy perspective. So, Abraham... Uh, now, another thing is... Um, the concubine is not the same as a wife. And furthermore, Hebrew doesn't really have a word for wife. Uh, it has a word, there, there's two different words that are used occasionally in, in Hebrew. One is Isha, which just means woman. And another one, I think it's like Beulah or something. And it, it basically means lord it over. Someone who is, um, like, because the person is a, the husband is the lord of the house, head of the house. And the wife is not the head of the house. She's underneath him. So she is considered lorded over. And that's according to the Hebrew. So those are the two words. Um, so when it says in Jubilees, Abraham took to himself a third wife, it actually, in the Hebrew, would say, took to himself a third woman. Um, and then there's a place in Chronicles, I believe it is, Book of Chronicles, which says that Abraham had more than one concubine. I believe this is a misunderstanding, like, what, that, I mean... He did have more than one concubine, but I think the word concubine itself is a misunderstanding in the Hebrew again. So we associate with concubine as like a secondary wife. A lot of people would, would render that. But from what I've seen in my studies, a concubine is actually a replacement, a substitute. In the context of like, for example, with Hagar, she was a substitute spouse. Um, temporarily so that he could have a child through her however in the case of of Keturah I actually think Keturah was a substitute entire like not a not a temporary one but a permanent one so he was married to Sarah Sarah died he needed to replace her with a new wife he didn't need to but he wanted to and and he decided to replace her or substitute her with a new wife, Keturah. So Keturah was a concubine in that sense, but was not a concubine in the secondary sense. She was a full wife, according to Jubilees. Um, let's see.
Then uh, another interesting detail we see, it's not in Genesis, is when Jacob and Esau are born, it tells us that Jacob learned to write, but Esau did not learn, for he was a man in the field and a hunter. And he learned war, and all his dear uh, and all his deeds were fierce. So, what we see here is uh, Jacob is is valued as the as the the better person for not being focused on the physical aspects, the physical labor, and fo he focuses on the the philosophical, the intellectual, the spiritual. Now you can't, both are not like, obviously they're not uh, mutually exclusive. Um, you can be an in, in intellectual and you can do physical labor. But in general, you kind of have to have one as your primary and another as your secondary. So Jacob, Jacob's primary was intellectual, but he also had some physical aspect of his work. Whereas Esau, Jubilee says, did not want to learn. He was not really interested in education. He preferred physical labor. And the implication is that because of Esau not learning this stuff, excuse me, because of that, Esau was a wicked man. Now, it doesn't mean that if you don't know how to write, you're wicked and that it's a sin, but what it means is that you don't have the guidance of intellectual pursuit, you are more likely to do base actions. Like you more, you're more likely to act like an animal. Um, you're more likely to just get angry when you, uh, and lash out at people and more likely to be confrontational in a physical manner. Whereas when you read certain things, it can calm it can calm you down, give you advice, and just make you a more patient person in general. And it also portrays him, his de deeds as fierce and that he was a hunter and that he learned war. These are not things that are necessarily bad, but in the way it emphasizes it for Esau, it seems like he was excessively that. Like, he was too eager for war, too eager for hunting, uh, too fierce. That's kind of how it seems to me. Now, I want to backtrack on one little thing. This is something important to, uh, to keep in mind. Like, there are a lot of people who like would look down on people who, like older men in their 60s or 70s who remarry a younger woman. Uh, and they say that that's just not right, or that just seems wrong, but we kind of see a sanction or an approval from Jubilees and Genesis. It, te you know, it, it tells us that it is okay, it's fine. You know, some, some people can't be alone when they're in, old, in their old age. They need, they need a partner. It's very hard. And what did Genesis tell us, you know? That Amen to that, brother! Woman was made to be the helper, so... Um, you know, I mean, it's a partnership. I, I don't mean that they're, I don't mean that woman, woman's only purpose is to serve men, but I mean, the marriage concept was created in a, in a way to complement each other where the woman helps the man. And if the man doesn't, doesn't have a woman to help him, he's helpless. So women are very important to have. And, and uh, Abraham understood that. And that's why he wanted another wife, and, and maybe he wanted more kids. You know, it's wonderful to have kids. And he was overcome with grief. Imagine just being very much in grief. Um, so I can definitely see why it would be nice to have a family. And I also know that having a family can keep you going. Like, if you have a family you have to take care of, that's responsibility. extra responsibility. It, it can keep you going. So anyways, we, we, we'll go on now. Now here's an interesting, um, oh, hold on. 
Oh, uh, Daniel, you asked, why is it an issue now? Many people are alone, especially men. Can you clarify that? You're saying, why is it a, why is it a bad thing? Well, no, uh, what, what you're seeing, the, the description of the, for the family, it's an awesome description and an awesome uh, structure for the family. But if you notice today in a society, you see a lot of people, if you'll read the newspaper, sometimes you'll hear about these incidents where older people are dying alone and they don't know about that person even dying for days, even months sometimes. Mm. So why, well, um, my, my question was, why is that such a, why are we seeing such an uptake on that? Oh, uh, I think it has to do with like the modernization of technology. Oh man, I, my head, sorry, I didn't realize the camera was way high up like that. Sorry. Um, but uh, I think it has to do with like the technology, like being so isolating. Like, like, you know, social media and all that stuff, internet, it just makes people more distant from each other. Not that those things are bad, it's just that it's an, un an unintended consequence of it. And, and in general, like, you know, the older you get, the fewer people in your life that you have anymore. And really, the fact is, family is all you have like in in the end of it i i find that family tends to be the only people left um sometimes you can have a really good friend that stays with you for your whole life but in my experience friendships haven't come and go or you have a really good friend and they die uh it, it's very hard to have friends there for you when you need them so family on the other hand you know if you have a, if you have kids it just really helps if if you're a, if you have a good relationship with your kids, they're there for you. They're, someone will take care of you, so that's really nice. Um, but a lot of people don't have that because there's not a lot of stability. Like family stability has declined in modern times with divorce rates skyrocketing and family family values being uh, attacked in various ways, like through the the whole. Um, homosexuality stuff and, and everything you know it it, it, it uh, has weakened the whole family structure in my view but so we'll get back to jubilees now this is really cool it's not specified in genesis it tells us that abraham loved jacob verse verse 15 but isaac loved Esau. and then in verse 16 it says and Abraham saw the deeds of Esau, and he knew that in Jacob should his name and seed be called. And he called Rebekah and gave commandment regarding Jacob. For he knew that she loved Jacob much more than Esau. So that's kind of funny. Like it says, um, Abraham uh, loved Jacob. But it says, Rebecca loved Jacob much more than Esau. Now, one thing that I strongly disagree with that a lot of people will say is that you can't have favorites. Uh, if you have kids, you're not supposed to have favorites. I, I've never understood that. Um, you know, when, when scripture says don't show favoritism, that's not what it means. Like, favoritism means, like, don't treat people differently because you like them like that's what it means it doesn't mean you can't have a favorite of something like it, but by definition if something is better than something else then you should that should be your favorite uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that you don't love them but it means like let, let's say you have let's say you have a son that hates you that hates your guts and curses you every day and wants nothing to do with you. Then you have a son that loves you very much and and is like your best friend. Well, it makes sense that you're going to love your one son more than the other. And it's just kind of funny because people don't want to say that because they, they feel like that's offensive to say that, oh, if you say that you love one son more than the other or one child more than the other, then that makes you a bad person. 
And again, and again, I don't, I don't think that's the case. And I think that's very damaging uh, to morality to suggest that. Because, for example, that there's a common theme, uh, claim with with God, or it should mean Elohim, and and uh, all of us. Like the basic idea is that. No one is better than anyone else because we're all sinners. We're all evil, despicable. You know that's what the, that's what Christians will say. Many, many Christians will say that. They say we we are totally depraved and things like that. That no one is better than the other, and that they take what James says when James says uh, he says, if you have broken one part of the law, you've broken the entire law, which is not what James is trying to say, but. That's how people understand him. They say that if you break even one law, it's the same as you've done any bad thing. So if someone steals something, they're just as bad as a murderer. That's how people interpret that, which is silly. But so along those lines, they say Elohim does not have a favorite. Like he he doesn't think one person is more righteous than the other, and it's just ridiculous. We know for a fact that he values people based on how righteous they are and how faithful they are. So the more righteous, the more faithful you are, the more he loves you. That's just how it is. So, also, we see, Genesis tells us that that Rebecca, um, like, it, it tells us Rebecca did certain things, but it doesn't tell us that it was okay, that it was a good thing. So it almost gives some people the impression that Rebecca was uh, going against Isaac in a sinful way. She wasn't following what Isaac says. She was doing her own thing. Jubilees, however, supports Rebecca and goes against Isaac. Jubilees tells us not that Isaac was sinning, but that Isaac was basically blinded by his own um, his own desires uh, for his family. He didn't understand. He blinded, blinded by his ignorance. That's the best way to put it. His innocent ignorance. Whereas Abraham and Rebecca, they could see clearly. They didn't have the bias that, that Isaac had. And they could see that Esau was, in general, a, a not a good person. Isaac, we are told later, loved his son because he was his firstborn. And you know, when you have your first child, you love that child, like, in a very special way. No one can take away the feeling you have for your first child. It's just something very special. So I, that's, what, that's why Isaac loved Esau so much. But what we see is that Abraham commanded Rebekah about Jacob. So Rebekah was actually not taking it up on her own initiative, but she was following the commandment of Abraham. She was doing what Abraham told her. So that is important to emphasize because some people think like when Re Rebecca did all that stuff to help Jacob that she was being bad, but not, not according to Jupiter's. Um, now, verse 17 says, Jacob will be the glory of the whole seed of Shem, which is interesting that it calls out, specifies Shem spe specifically, you know. Why the seed of Shem? Well, I think it's related to the whole Semitic, you know, the Semitic peoples. Because all, uh, like, like for Arabs and others, are Semitic. They're from Shem's line. So, Israel is for the glory of all the seed of Shem, according to Jubilees. That's what Abraham told Rebecca. And okay, let's see. And this is interesting. It says, verse 21, Abraham says, let thy heart rejoice in thy son Jacob, for I have loved him far beyond all my sons. Which is a very powerful thing to say. Um, 
it basically sounds like he's saying that he loves Jacob more than Isaac and more than and more than any of his sons or descendants which is a pretty strong thing to say that you love your grandson more than your son um, I don't think it's because like I don't think Isaac and Abraham had a bad relationship I just think I you know Covenants were made with Abraham and covenants were made with Jacob. Uh, Isaac is sort of the in-between. He's kind of the transition between Abraham to Israel. Isaac's important, but compared to Abraham and Jacob, Isaac is much less significant. And as far as I know, according to the scriptures, there's no evidence that Isaac ever wrote a book. Like, you know the Genesis Apocrypha. It has a book of Noah, a book of, well, it has a book of Lamech, a book of Noah, Book of Abraham, Jubilee tells us it's a book of Jacob, but Jubilee never tells us that Isaac wrote a book. And so far, I have not seen any evidence that there was an Isaac book. And it would be very hard for there to be an Isaac book and a Jacob book because hard in the sense that it would overlap so much. There wouldn't be a lot of fresh material for Isaac to cover. Uh, there's just not much information. Uh, in the story of Isaac compared to that of Abraham and Jacob. Like, um, Jacob's story begins when Abraham's story ends, essentially. Abraham dies and Jacob's a young, a young child. So. Uh, so Isaac's story is kind of subsumed into both Abraham's story and Jacob's. Now, Isaac probably wrote like a testament. Each of the patriarchs probably gave a last testament. But in terms of an actual whole book, it doesn't seem like Isaac did. And uh, so, yeah, that's just amazing that apparently Abraham loved Jacob more than Isaac, his own son. And then it says, in verse 24, And in his seed shall my name be blessed, and the name of my fathers Shem and Noah and Enoch and Mahalalel and Enosh and Seth and Adam. And these shall serve to lay the foundations of the heaven and to strengthen the earth and to renew all the luminaries which are in the firmament. Now, something is strange here. For some reason, Abraham does not list all the, the fathers from Shem to Adam. So here's how it goes from Adam to, to Shem. It goes, Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Lamech, Noah, Shem. What names do does Abraham not mention in his list of the fathers? He doesn't mention Canaan. He doesn't mention uh, Jared. He doesn't mention Lamech. And, uh, excuse me, and also Methuselah. He does not mention Methuselah. So Methuselah, Jared, Lamech, and Canaan are not mentioned. And it says, and it says uh, in that following verse that those men specifically were the foundations. Um, they served to lay the foundations of the heaven and to strengthen the earth and to renew all the luminaries. So, um, well, in the seed of those, uh, I assume, hold on a second. No, okay, so it, it looks like it's saying in his seed, his, Jacob's seed will lay the foundations of the heaven and strengthen the earth and renew all the luminaries. So I misinterpreted that. But so we, I have read commentary before, like R.H. Charles gives footnotes and Vanderkam sometimes gives footnotes. And they ask in the footnotes, why are not all the, the fathers from Adam to Shem named. Well, what I discovered is that three of the fathers 
all died in the year of the flood, according to the Samaritan Torah. And so that could be significant. The fact that all three died in the, in the flood, in the year of the flood. Uh, Lamech, Methuselah, and Jared, all according to the Samaritan version of the book of Genesis, they all died in the year of the flood. That just leaves, with, that just leaves Canaan, but Canaan is, if I understand correctly, I think that Hebrew word is connected with Cain, like the same root. So perhaps the similarity of the name of Cain is why Abraham doesn't mention the name of Canaan. I don't know for certain, but that's just speculation. But it is interesting to look at some of those details and see, huh, I wonder why. Another possibility is that scribes removed those names for some reason. Or maybe maybe they removed Kenan accidentally, but the other three were, were removed for the reason I mentioned, because they died in the year of the flood, so they weren't mentioned. So there's a couple possibilities there. And then after he tells, so after he tells Rebecca to to uh, love Jacob and make sure he receives what belongs to him. He then calls Jacob before the eyes of Rebekah, his mother, and, and blesses him. And says, Jacob, my beloved son, whom my soul loveth, may God bless thee from above the firmament, and may he give thee all the blessings wherewith he blessed Adam, Enoch, Noah, and Shem, and all the things of which he told thee, and all the things which he promised to give me. May he cause to cleave to thee and to thy seed forever, according to the days of heaven above the earth. And the spirits of the steamers shall not rule over thee or over thy seed to turn thee from the Lord, who is thy God from henceforth forever. May the Lord God be a father to thee, and now the firstborn son, and to the people always. So imagine you're a young kid, and your grandpa says, like, yeah, you're the best, and you're going to get everything. You know, these things, Abraham was sowing these things into Jacob's mind at an early young age. He was basically reinforcing the understanding that, it, that Jacob was going to be better than Esau. So that's an important context to understand the family dynamic here. And in this instance, when he's talking to his son, I mean, his grandson Jacob, he only mentions the names Adam, Enoch, Noah, and Shem. And those are because those men are the most significant of the line. Adam, since he was the first of all. Enoch, he walked, he walked with Elohim and he was, uh, and, and Noah walked with Elohim. And then Shem, he is the holy line. Jubilees tells us that Shem was to be the holy line, that the promised land was given to Shem and Shem's descendants. And Genesis Apocryphon confirms that as well. And as I mentioned in previous teachings, Genesis Apocryphon is like the brother of Jubilees, or the cousin. They're closely connected, and it's amazing how much it connects with Jubilees. Like, there's so many details found in Jubilees which are elsewhere only in Genesis of Apocrypha. It kind of, like, if Jubilees is legit, Genesis of Apocrypha must be legit. If Genesis of Apocrypha is legit, Jubilees must be legit. Like, they go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Okay. Then, sorry about the... Question? Can I, yeah? Did you, at one time, um, equate the Genesis Apocryphon with the Book of Lamech. You said the Book of Lamech? You gave it another name. Instead of the Apocryphon, you called it... Oh, uh, well, scholars, scholars called it the Apocalypse of Lamech before, yeah. before they unraveled the whole thing. Because oh. they, they took fragments off the top and saw it talking about Lamech. They assumed the whole scroll was about Lamech. And then once they opened it, they realized, oh, no, it's not. So they renamed it Genesis Apocrypha. So that's the old name. Yeah, Lamech Apocalypse is the old name. And Genesis Apocrypha is the new name. Um, 
Donald says grandkids are the best. Much easier. Looks like we got. Looks like we've got someone who likes his grandkids more than his kids. Uh oh. Don't tell your kids that. So I'm not sure I like any of them much. Uh, so then, it says that Abraham called Ishmael and his twelve sons. So Ishmael's twelve sons and Isaac and his two sons. And the six sons of Keturah and their sons. Imagine that, that gathering. Ishmael and his sons, Isaac and his sons, and the sons of Keturah. All together. And and uh, that is pretty impressive. Like He's keeping in cut, touch with all his family. And so, so it looks like Abraham had... Looks like he had 20 grandchildren. Pretty amazing. At least that we know of. 20 sons, grandchildren that are males, but maybe he had daughters. And we know that scripture doesn't mention daughters as often. So as far as we know, Abraham could have had like tons of daughters. We don't even know. Um, oh. Um, no, it's not a... The dog in the background is not because of the sirens. It's because um, people are moving around inside. Like, and uh, whenever my mom comes home, she freaks out and like goes crazy. So that's probably what it was. Um, so yeah, twenty grandsons, not including granddaughters. How many he ever had? Maybe he didn't have any, but it is seem a little bit strange that he wouldn't have any daughter, granddaughters. Um, well, he commanded all. He commanded the sons of Ishmael, and the sons of Keturah, and the sons of Isaac, that they should observe the way of the Lord. They should work righteousness and love each his neighbor. And act on this manner amongst all men, that they should each so walk with regard to them as to do judgment and righteousness on the earth, that they should circumcise their sons according to the covenant which he had made with them, and not deviate to the right hand or to the left of all the paths which the Lord had commanded us. Hold on, wait a minute. Us? I thought this was third person. Then all of a sudden it transitions to first person. Well, again, this is a scribal error. We see the same scribal error in the book of Enoch, where Enoch is talking, and then all of a sudden Noah is talking. There's no transition. There's all kinds of things like that. So we we have that in in uh, Jubilees here, where the angels are telling us that Abraham was telling his children commands and then in the middle of Jubilees telling us that he's doing this all of a sudden Abraham is talking in the first person so somewhere there's a quotation that starts I think it actually starts where it says that they should observe the way of the Lord in verse 2 I think that's where the quotations start and so that it should be in first person not in the third person and then it says, okay, so we should keep for ourselves from all fornication and uncleanness and renounce from amongst us all fornication and uncleanness. And if any woman or maid commit fornication amongst you, burn her with fire and let them not commit fornication with her after their eyes and their heart. And let them not take to themselves wives from for the seed of Canaan will be rooted out of the land. Um... Now, I want to stop there for a sec. So what I've discovered in my research before is that the Acts Council, chapter 15, seems to be a throwback to this chapter of Jubilees. Jubilees is telling us that uh, he's giving commandments, uh, Abraham is giving commandments to his children. And the commandments are to abstain from uncleanness and fornication um and 
Um, I thought it also said blood. Like, do not shed uh, blood or something. Or maybe that's earlier in Jubilees. But anyway, it's either this chapter or an earlier chapter. There appears to be a definite connection between Acts chapter 15 and the requirements that are being given. So I, I think that needs to be investigated further because that could explain, potentially help explain what Acts chapter 15 is talking about. Um, and then it says, okay, so uh, one interesting detail is here Abraham tells us that if, a, if a, any woman or a young woman commits fornication, burn, she is to be burned with fire. Now, when it says fornication, I think it's talking about whoring. I don't think it's talking about having sex before marriage. Because the, one, the Torah tells us that if a woman is seduced by a man, they simply are to marry. She is, uh, the man is to take her as his wife and not divorce her all his days. But he has to have the father's permission still. Um, so that's with if you have sex before marriage. So when it says fornication, I think it's really talking about like whoring, prostitution. And in Leviticus, it tells us that if a priest, oh, if a, if a daughter of a priest uh, prostitutes herself, she is to be burned with fire. That's in Leviticus, but but it doesn't say anything about a regular woman doing that. But Abraham tells us the truth, that, that, it is, the, that is the case. That we, ha we gotta ask, why is that? Why by fire? Well, the Torah tells us that each crime is an eye for an eye. And, it, and the punishment is related to what was being done. So, certain, sto certain crimes were to be stoned to have a punishment of stone to death because because those crimes were very hard-hearted as hard as stone you know and then these ones uh like the, the sexual crimes in particular adultery and prostitution those are crimes of passion of fire in the heart so it would make sense very fitting that fire is to be uh, the means of punishment. And then you have what Jubilees tells us that if any man is, okay, with the instrument that you harm someone else, with that same instrument, you should be harmed to the same degree. So it's an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Uh, if you kill someone with a sword, you should be killed with a sword. If you kill someone with a gun, you should be killed with a gun. That's the way Jubilee system works. Um, it's pretty harsh, but that, that's how that's that's a, a very fair way to do it. You know, if you take someone's eye out, how is that fair for you not to be punished at all? You should suffer that same fate. Your eye should be removed, according to Jubilees and the Torah. Now there is a rabbinic thing that, that occurs where the rabbis basically try to undermine this law of an eye for an eye and they basically say well that means a, a monetary payment if you cut someone's eye out uh, you need to pay money and then you're and that's your punishment which doesn't make sense how is that eye for an eye it's not the, they base that idea off of one part of the tour which says if a slave's eye is cut out then you shall set him free they argue, well, that's evidence that it's a monetary thing. Well, that's for a slave. And we know, like, from the Code of Hammurabi, that slaves did not have as many rights at that time. And I mentioned Code of Hammurabi because a lot of the laws in that, as well as other law books of that time from other cultures, they have similar laws and similar values in general. Not exact. The Bible laws, I think, are much better than these other cultures, but they have similar concepts. And the concept that we see throughout all cultures in that time, and heavily in the scriptures, is that slaves have less rights. And if a slave dies um, on the job, 
as long as the slave owner um, wasn't horribly responsible for it, then then uh, the punishment is to be monetary rather than eye for an eye. So, um, anyways, all that to say. Jubilees gives us that extra detail that we don't see anywhere else that this law is for prostitution in general, not just for prostitution of priest daughters, but for any prostitute, uh, she's to be burned. And okay, and then it says Abraham told them the judgment of the giants and the judgment of the sodomites, how they had been judged on account of their wickedness. Hey, uh, Anya, let me ask you this question. I think this is a good one. And uh, what you just read, is that the statute that Judah used when they, remember when Tamar, they found Tamar to be pregnant uh, and, they, and he said, let, let her be brought out and burned. Is that the statute that they used for ju Jubilees? Yeah, that, that, that's the base. That's the basic same thing. And some people have criticized Judas for saying that, uh, but Jubilees portrays that as the right thing, and and that is, it was the right thing that, only in the sense that that crime deserved it. But it was very wrong that Judah was being hypocritical, because he slept with a prostitute. So. Uh, But when, once he realized that he was just as guilty, he couldn't. He couldn't do that. He couldn't punish Timon. That that would have uh, not been righteous for him to do that. So, um, Sherry, I'm not sure I agree, but you want to share. Your perspective on that? Uh, you said Tamar was likely of priestly origin, not just parallel stories. If you want, you can uh, share about that. Or if not, that's fine. Just let me know. Okay. Yeah, you could always talk with me about it some other time. Um, so, but even if she was, you know, let's just say along that line, she was of priestly origin. Here, uh, Abraham says, if any woman or maid commit fornication unless she burn her with fire. So at least in this instance, he, it seems to be applying this, um, this punishment across the board, not just for daughters of priests. Now, we're, we're told that um, Abraham told his grandchildren about the, the judgment of the giants and of the sodomites and how they were condemned for what they did. And so this kind of reminds me of where in Genesis it says they were the heroes of old, of renown or something along those lines. The, the giants. Um, so it's like those are the, the, the people from long ago that we, that we talked about. Gibberim. Uh, yeah, the Gibberim. Gibberim. Should be tyrants. Um, okay. So it says, guard yourselves from all fornication and uncleanness and from all pollution of sin. Now this is for, this was commanded for the, all his grandchildren, so that includes the Arabs, the Arabic people, because Arabic uh, people were descended from Ishmaelites and, and the children of the Torah. And it tells us that, you know, the Torah gives laws of uncleanness, like kosher laws and um, don't touch certain things, or if you touch certain things, you have to purify yourself because you're unclean. Jubilee tells us guard yourself uh, from uncleanness, and he's committing that to all his grandchildren, not just to the Israelites. So this seems to be a law that's for Gentiles in general, um, or at least for 
or at least for um, Arabic people. And we, and we see that the Arabs, they, they do have a law like that. Well, they, don't, they don't keep kosher exactly, but, but they keep a lot of the kosher laws. They try to be pure. And I think they do circumcision as well, although I could be mistaken. Ronnie, question. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the Samaritans versus the uh, Israelites who, or the Judahites who went to, into uh, Babylonian captivity on who was who and who was what? That has a whole lot to do with scripture and whose scripture is right and succession of priesthood and all that stuff. Oh, okay. Um, well, I think the Samaritan Torah is more accurate than the Masoretic Torah in general. Me too. But it's kind of unclear exactly where the Samaritan Torah originates. And I am of the view that the Samaritan group is not uh, the, you know, the, the legit line. Why? Um, no. Why? Wait. Because... No. So, there's certain books which, which suggest that, uh, which, which certain apocryphal books as well as the New Testament. But in, in general, uh, there is a lineage... The it's the sons of basically it's the sons, 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 sons in that line of Levi. Who wrote that and when though? Who who wrote uh, that particular passage and when? Oh, for the for the laws of lineage. Yeah. Um. What's the provenance? I mean, it's found in the it's found in the law of Moses in the in the five books. So. Uh, it goes back very ancient. Uh, okay. All right. My, my question that I'm basing this off of is some commentary that I've read. If you bear with me for a minute. Um, what they said was, in the Babylonian captivity, um, only the noble people, the people who were wealthy and possibly high up in the priesthood, got taken into captivity and they were actually treated pretty well um but the people of the the normal people the people who were actually of the land and of the people um got scattered and burned out but they were still there okay does this follow anything you've ever heard yeah yeah okay so they kept their tour that they had okay the things that they knew from the country priests and whatnot, or the, however you want to say, um, non-city priest. I don't mean country, you know. All right, so um, the people who came out of the Babylonian captivity rewrote what they had had taken and burnt up and destroyed and all that stuff from their memory. Now, their memory is a different memory from what the people who were left in the land had right you follow that yes right so you think that the people who are left in the land had a more proper uh translation or understanding than the people who came out of the babylonian captivity what do you think um so it seems from what from what i can tell that all the copies were lost at that time and then they were able to restore the copies but a lot of what you were saying uh, in that idea that you suggested, um, I don't find it so plausible for the reason I, th I think, like, the, the Samaritans have never been a fan of Jerusalem. And I, right. if I understand correctly, it says that p the priests and the people were left to take care of Jerusalem and they were, they were left there. So I, I don't see how the priests would abandon Jerusalem. If the Samaritans were the legit ones, why would they then go away from Jerusalem? If, I get uh, that. If they were still in the land the whole time. Uh, I, I yeah. do understand that. But my, my main question is, well, maybe it's my misunderstanding. If there were a whole lot, if there was a centralized priesthood that had one agenda, and then there was a countryside parish sort of with the people priesthood who had another understanding, and nobody could write except the scribes. That is the important question, 
point to understand here. No one really wrote unless you were of the upper class and learned how to write and read and were a scribe. Everything else with the written word, right? So when you come back after captivity, you can write what you want. Um, the people who had it by an oral tradition who had stayed in the land forever, who were not taken as hostages and important people might have a different story than the ones who were taken. That's just my premise. And it's something that I found in somebody's um, book somewhere. And I just wanted to see what everybody thought about that. I'm sorry. I'll oh, shut up now. Um, I don't know that. Um, yeah, the, well, sure. yeah, I don't know. See, here's the way I understand the Babylonian captivity. <laughs> I understand the Babylonian captivity. There were three different <laughs> waves that went out from Babylon. When uh, they came <coughs> to ba when the Babylonian army came in, um, Jeremiah told them to go out and to surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. They did that, though, and the city was spared. That first wave of people that went out from Jerusalem at that time was people, the nobles, the uh, some of the top leadership among among those was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They went away in chains um, to Babylon. Uh, they set in place another government, and that government rebelled. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had to come in there. They had to come in there again, okay? And then, of course, you know, that's when they killed a lot of people uh, from that second administration, okay? They, they really just killed everybody. And it was at this time that they burned the temple. The first time they took things out of there. The second time that Nebuchadnezzar had to go in there, they burned the thing down. Then there was a third entrance into Babylon, and that's when the captain, captain of the guard went in there. And they cleaned some people out then. So I, I find it hard to believe that Nebuchadnezzar would have allowed, particularly after the second time, to allow everything except the bare necessities to be stripped. What do you think? I think the, the priesthood uh, pretty much ceased when the... Like, there was no priestly stuff going on at the temple um, when there was the exile going on. The people that stayed there, they were allowed to take care of the fields, it says. But, but I don't think they were doing any of the other stuff. Um, and certainly, certainly if it was the Samaritans taking care of the fields, fields they were not uh, doing the, temple, the Jerusalem temple. There wasn't practicing any kind of religion at all. Because it, it was, especially after that second time that Nebuchadnezzar had to come in there, they burned the religious institution to the ground at that point. That's the way I understand it. Right. And it, it seems to me to be um, – see, the other thing, Allison, is the Samaritans don't have any of the other prophets – um, so you kind of have to say, okay, so why are they not, like, what's their motivation for not accepting those prophets? And, um, I would think depending on who, which group they lined up with after the return, I think that has a whole lot to do with everything. Um, but that's you know you're more of a scholar than I am. I was just asking your opinion. Well, Thank you. Don't, Thank you so uh, much. Hold on. Um, you know Yeshua said that he would, he would. Uh, what is it? Something along the lines of uh, the bring to not the knowledge of the the wisdom of the of the wise and. And those who are less lessers or considered lessers would be given given great wisdom. So I would say, you know, don't just uh, discount yourself by saying like, 
that I'm I'm the scholar and you're not. So you know what I mean, like. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, every, I, everyone's a scholar, you know. Um, no, I do. It's, degrees. I thank you, and I'm just. I I will listen to you first. It's it's good. You have a whole lot more information than I do. I just have several uh, commentaries that I've read, and I'm not as well read as you are. So thank you. And I just had an just had an idea. Just thought. Thanks. Yeah, sure thing. Um. Oh no, who left? We had 10 participants and it's now down to nine. That's okay. Uh, I'm gonna be wrapping this up shortly, but uh, I just say as a final, I, I do wanna close on the Jubilees, but I will just say for the Samaritan, um, I, I think the, from, from what I see, um, I always try to approach things from a benefit of the doubt approach. And so least conspiratorial, I, I'm not a big conspiracy person. I always try to look at it in from a perspective of how is it possible that everybody could be right or as right as possible um, based on their opinion or perspective. Um, so least amount of intentional lying or complete fabrication. I try to avoid those allegations as best as possible. So from what I see, the best way to explain it by being fair to all sides and giving everyone equal uh, a caution, um, the way I see it is that the um, the Samaritans wanted to, uh, I, I think there's a passage in Ezra and Nehemiah which says that the Samaritans wanted to help the Jews build the temple, in the second temple. They did not allow the Samaritans to do that. So it seems like they decided, okay, well, we'll build our own temple then. So they built a temple and then somehow the Samaritan Torah came about in its in its form um because i as i've said before i believe the temple scroll represents a closer form to the original and the temple scroll gives laws for the temple and uh how to build it whereas the samaritan tour does does not have laws for that so somehow i think the samaritan tour came into existence and then generations later the samaritans only had a samaritan tour and they had their temple, and and there's a part in in the Samaritan Torah which says that they are to build an altar on the mountain of blessing, Mount Gerizim. Even the Masoretic text says the Mount uh, Mount Gerizim is the mountain of blessing. So uh, the, the the Samaritans saw that and they put two and two together and thought, okay, well then. If the mountain of blessing is Mount Gerizim, and that's where we have our temple, uh, that's where our temple should be. Um, like that—that that seems the line of reasoning they had there. Um, and then the Samaritans are most certainly descended from the Israelites. The question is whether they are um, from the patrilineal line that Scripture says is required for the priestly line, and. I've seen some documents which say that they were descended from the mother, the the the, the mother line instead of the father. Um, so, in other words, one of some of Israel's Israelites' daughters married um, married other men. And then those men like converted to Israel religion and they consider themselves Israelites. And then they had descendants and they had descendants. Um, but according to the Torah, their descendants are not in the Levitical line anymore because once a woman marries another man, she leaves the house and enters into the house of her husband. So there's so much more about the Samaritan Torah 
we'll have to talk about it another time. I appreciate you asking about it and uh, thank you. Have a discussion I, about it. I really, from past, I'm sorry, guys, sorry. from past episodes of um, Unya talking, I kind of feel that, and from some of the uh, historical writers who have, or historians who have written, I think maybe perhaps Onya is right that, in a way, that the Samaritan might have a whole lot of uh, this, importance. This Torah, maybe? Yeah, might have a whole lot of importance that we don't give it. I think there's a whole lot of stuff there that we're just not seeing. I agree with all the stuff I've always heard about. You know, it that you have said. I don't in understand it as well as I should. That's why I'm still in the iffy place. But thank you. Hey, Thanks. You Final thing on that. Samaritan Torah. Support for it briefly. Not, not long at all. Septuagint. It has tons of agreements with Septuagint. Has tons of agreements with, with copies of the Torah found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Has many agreements with the Book of Jubilees. And so those things together make strong indication that the Samaritan Torah is a more reliable version of the Torah than Masoretic text that we have of the Torah. Um, so I'm going to wrap this up for Jubilees, uh, and then if you guys have any questions, let me know. So I'm going to end with chapter 20 today. I was hoping to go a little farther. We got subject, but that's okay. Um, so we see that Abraham talks to his grandchildren and tells them uh, not to worship idols and not to make idols for yourself. And then it says, Work uprightness and righteousness before Elohim. Serve him and worship him continually. Why? In order that he may have pleasure in you and grant you his mercy and send rain upon, morning, upon you morning and evening and bless all your works which ye have wrought upon the earth and bless thy bread and thy water and bless the fruit of thy womb, and the fruit of thy land, and the herds of thy cattle, and the flocks of thy sheep. And ye shall be a blessing on the earth, and all nations of the earth will desire you, and bless your sons in my name, that they may be blessed as I am. So, there's a little bit to unpack there. So, Abraham just told us, work upright, uprightness and righteousness in order that God will give you mercy. Elohim will give you mercy. That flies straight in the face of what Christianity says, a lot of Christians say. They say, we're saved as Abraham was saved, you know, by faith, not works, blah, blah, blah. But here we have Abraham saying, in order to receive mercy, first work righteousness. Then you will receive mercy. In order that you will receive mercy. It says. So, along those lines, it also says, and... You will be blessed with physical blessings, good weather, and um, all your work will be blessed, and your animals and your your land and and your food and stuff. So that connects with the Torah, which gives blessings for obedience of the law and curses for disobedience. This is a very important thing that is very relevant for our time. I think these laws of curses and blessings are forever binding. And so if people have uh, problems, if they have illness, disease, sickness, all kinds of things, or if they're not successful in life for certain reasons, there's two reasons why that could be or maybe, maybe three or something. So these are the reasons. One, it's because of you that you were guilty of sin, and because of that, you are suffering. It's your fault. That's one. 
And we can't say that's the only reason because we know with the whole thing with Job, right? So that's one. Number two is someone intentionally tried to harm you, and that's why you're suffering. Because someone could poison you or give you a disease intentionally because they're trying to hurt you. So that's the second reason. And then the third reason is a complete accident, and that would be like a natural disaster where it's outside of your control. Um, you're, you, you just happen to be in a place where there's an earthquake or a, a hurricane or whatever, or a nuclear, uh, a power plant exploding or whatever. So those are the ways that you could can, receive uh, disease. Can you recap that again? One, two, and three. Just to... Um, what do you mean, one, two, and three? Can you say the three reasons again? Oh, okay. So either because of your own actions, like basically because you sinned, or someone sinned against you, or an accident, either... You accidentally hurt yourself, or someone accidentally hurt you, or natural accident, um, where like a natural disaster happens. Okay. Harmed. That's the only way you get illness or disease. All right. Like accident or ignorance by you or someone else. Got it. Uh, natural disaster, or you sinned, or someone sinned against you. Hmm. Okay, thank you. And that's an important principle that a lot of people don't care about, but it's very relevant because many people are in condemnation and they don't realize it. They're not really paying attention. Um, if they pay attention, these are called signs. The Torah calls it signs. These, these diseases are signs that you have disobeyed the, the Torah. So as we all get older, I mean, I'm pretty young right now, but uh, as we're all older, I mean, many of us only started keeping Torah recently, in relatively speaking. So if you didn't keep Torah in your early life, well, then that might come to haunt you because, you know, actions have consequences. Even if you repent, unless you're healed by a miracle, you may still be, you may still die or get disease from things you did way in the past that were against Torah. But it's best to start keeping Torah now, and the more you keep it, the healthier you'll be, and you will be blessed. You will not you will not harm your health anymore. So, just evaluate where you are in life, and if you're coming down with these illnesses, then that means you did something wrong, most likely, or someone. Again, the, the three examples, but keep it. Try to observe what type of things caused it, like, like for example. If you have diabetes, it's pretty certain that it's because of something you did, either by accident, ignorance, or sin. It's not the other reasons, you know. So you got to kind of look towards yourself and see what did I do wrong, if anything, to cause it. What about heredity? Uh, so that would be an example of, um, of someone, uh, someone else, either they did something, to their body that messed up their genetics themselves and then they passed on their messed up genetics or as I said you know an accident so it's probably the case that certain uh, certain genetic couplings uh, result in complete accidents like I know I've heard of diseases which are like one in a million odds or something like one in a million births come with this birth defect um, but I will say this, I have a strong suspicion. Now, a lot of people would, would disagree with this, but I think it may have merit. It's something to consider. I don't have absolute proof this is the case, but I think it's very possible that a lot of, a lot of birth defects and problems are caused during the pregnancy, especially uh, like if, if you do uh, unhealthy things during that time, and one of, the, one of the things I think can cause it is sex during pregnancy. A lot of people say it doesn't harm the baby, but uh, the Essenes spoke against it. They, they said it is not to be done, and I think there's a good case to be made that it is at least potentially harmful. Uh, of course, at different stages, um, like in the third trimester, it's probably the least harmful because they're the most developed 
But I, I really think that the first and second trimester are the most vulnerable for a fetus that are developing. So we know that according to the scripture, when a man and wife have sex, it causes uncleanness that needs to be purified. I think that uncleanness, if it's in the woman's system, could then contaminate uh, the fetus inside her and cause some illness at a very early stage. And the earl when it's at an earlier stage, an illness could, could very easily lead to a birth defect. So we definitely have to be careful with that, I think. Uh, so that could explain some of the genetic stuff too, uh, her or hereditary. Things. And the final thing to note for this is that it says that um, Ishmael and his sons and the sons of Keturah and their sons went together and dwelt from Paran to the entering in of Babylon and all land which is towards the east facing the desert. And these mingled with each other and their name was called Arabs and Ishmaelites. This is also an example of potentially a scribal edition. So either the angels are telling this to Moses, they mingled together and then they were called Arabs and Ishmaelites. Or it was a scribal addition explaining that they, were, they became Arabs eventually. I'm kind of leaning more towards that this might be a scribal addition. Because I think, I mean, the term Arab became, uh, I'm not sure it's that old as Jubilees claims to be. So. But it's unclear. So anyways, uh, this is going to be where we end. Uh, but I want to give an opportunity for anyone to ask any questions about what we discussed. Um, and if, if you have a burning question about something that we didn't discuss, then you could always at, type it up and I can see if I want to answer it, but, if, but I might not. And uh, if that's the case, you can always hit me up on Facebook and we can discuss anything you want to discuss. Hey, I thank you so much. This was awesome. Very in-depth, very uh, detailed, and so well thought out. I thank you so much for coming on here and sharing all the stuff that most people would think is crazy, but <laughs> all of us love. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, yeah. We only got two chapters today. That's that's uh, very frustrating. Only in the sense, not for not frustrated with anyone here, but I'm like... It's like, oh, I wish we could do more, you know, but it's... Oh, yeah. I mean, nobody else understands. You know, you have to pick your audience, and your and audience it be, is it's, here. It's going to be a little bit, uh, like, we're going to we're gonna have, like, 20, 20 or something Jubilees videos, probably, so, or maybe even more. Hey, that's awesome. But uh, have... I guess if people like it. Oh, yeah. Look, if you have a legacy... Then you have done your work, my man. You have d fulfilled your calling. Leave something behind for others to watch and learn from, man. And well thank you. So, any, anyone uh, have anything they want to say? If not, we'll end it here. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, on the chat, are you going to be having a Pentecost boot camp? Oh, okay. And that's uh, uh, June 6th through 10. It's on the Zadokite calendar. Uh, I put a link up, www.essene.faith, for you. Uh, details are there. And we have a Shabbat service every Shabbat at 11 o'clock. We have good attendance. You're welcome to come. And also we have, uh, we have our uh, controversial forum at 1 o'clock on Shabbat. Now we'll add this Wednesday night again until we finish up. And I appreciate you all supporting the ministry and certainly for coming tonight. This information, well, you're not going to get it anyplace else. This is all. We've got this savant here. And <laughs> he's doing good and we've appreciated him for years and I have a lot of his recordings too out at my place. So Thank you for coming, and uh, may you all be blessed. Hey, Jackson, one question. 
What's yeah. that uh, controversial thing you said on Sabbaths? Controversial. I just call it controversial now. It's controversial topics. We started out using controversial scriptures, and it went to controversial topics, and they have been very controversial, but they've also been, been very orderly as well. And I guess we have probably about a dozen of those now or so that are posted. And you're more than welcome to come. It's a forum, or, so you can is it like So it's like, it's like uh, not predetermined what it's going to be about? Well, yes, there's a, a little bit of a topic. Last time we did comments on M. Scott Peck's, um, <laughs> what's the name of that book? I forgot now. Oh, shoot. It's... Um... I've forgotten too, but it's about um, communal evil and also yeah. um, the appearance of um, the serpent sort of creature and exorcism. It's yeah. in, in psychology. It's amazing. Scott it, Peck is, was, he's a psychoanalyst. He's dead now, of course, but he came out with some revolutionary books. Uh, proving that there was evil behind some of these mental problems. And yeah, so what he's written is very analytical, but this next time... The collective Shabbat, evil. Yeah, collective oh. evil. We're going to look at the My Lai Massacre. Yes. You know, old guy like me, you'll remember that. I think it was a 67, 68, something like that. And it was in the papers for a long time where we had some... Uh, Armed Forces people in Vietnam that just went absolutely nuts and mowed down several villages. And this thing all happened like with your finger up. Yeah, it all happened like spontaneously. And so this week, uh, Pack is going to analyze some of that shortly, and then we'll talk about it. It's going right, to cool. be good. Last one was really good. Yes, and the biggest thing is uh, we did this once before. Sorry, Jackson. Uh, we Go did ahead. this once before back in uh, like June or maybe July. And we talked about this uh, collective evil thing. And it was powerful. It's how, look, you can fall into this very easily. You need to consciously not. You need to consciously resist. It is an amazing, amazing book and teaching and it's going to be great great thing for us to listen to and talk about because we are here to ameliorate creation and do things that have never been done before we need to listen to this okay thank you sorry thanks for thanks for sharing uh allison and jackson i appreciate sorry it. All right, Jackson, you want to close it out? Where did he go? Did he go to the bathroom, Jackson? You still alive, Jackson? I've just been on mute. Yeah, I'm done. Did you have a heart attack? Not, not this time, but uh, keep watching. It'll happen. We, we right don't, before we your want eyes. You, we, we want you here for the next three decades. Okay, we'll be here. Thank you, brother. Love you, too. Love you guys. Peace.